Well, this is our last get-together in the book of Romans. And I really hope that you've enjoyed your time in this wonderful and foundational letter over the past year. I've been challenged remarkably as a result of my personal study, uh, just getting ready for these short videos. And what you probably don't know is that to produce a little 10-minute video like this requires me about four to eight hours of study and writing, uh, recording, editing. So by the time the video is updated to the interweb, I've been able to put significant time into the text. So I have just thoroughly enjoyed these studies and have uh, needed to make significant change in my own life as a result, uh, not the least of which revolves around today's text. And to finish Romans in 12 weeks means that I need to cover chapters 14 through 16 today. Not ideal. Uh, it's, it's a pretty good chunk of scripture to cover in 10 minutes, so I'll just focus the majority of our time on what I would say is probably the more important section and then in your own study, you can determine if there are other sections which you believe you need to explore more and spend more time in. I've said it before, so in the way of review, let's just talk about Romans 1 through 11. And these chapters lay this foundation for salvation. We talked at length about law versus grace and Jews and Gentiles and the blood of animal sacrifice versus the blood of Christ and the hopelessness of sin. That all forms this foundation of the what's and the why's of salvation. But it can't stop there. The knowledge of salvation, even the acceptance of salvation, is just not enough for a Christian to possess. Like I've said before, anytime we receive something from God, that demands a response from us. And salvation is no different. Once we have received Christ as our Savior for our sins, that salvation now demands from all believers a response. One such response is how we act in love towards others, uh, in particular other believers. So with that, let's pick up in Romans 14, and I'm just going to start in verse 13 and just make a few comments and connections throughout. I apologize for my nose, by the way. I'm uh, deeply congested with allergies, so as I sniff throughout, please forgive me. Hopefully this season as well will pass. But Paul begins in uh, Romans 14 and verse 13, Let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. And quite honestly, this is one issue that I've been working on for some time now. One of the easiest things we can do as believers is to judge others for what we view as deficiencies in their life. And I don't know about you, but what I found to be the case in my own life is that the things I would judge as deficiencies in others were oftentimes a simple difference of opinion or our choice or preference. And the issue was not at all even a spiritual issue. There was just some preference that I had, uh, and because that was right for me, I had a tendency to think lesser of someone else because they didn't hold to my superior opinion. And Paul's words echo the words of Christ in Matthew 7, where Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the measure of judgment you impose on another, that same measure will be coming back to you. And then Paul gives an alternative to judging that gets to the meat of this passage. Now back to Romans 14. He says, But rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. He uses that as a contrast to judging. Basically, your conduct should never be such that it causes one to sin or causes them to offend against their conscience, what they believe to be righteous living before a holy God. Paul goes on in verse 14, I know and I am persuaded that in the Lord Jesus, nothing in itself is unclean, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. And I'm convinced Paul is speaking here of you know, grayish areas within the Christian life. He addresses one earlier in the chapter, this gray area of observing a day of rest or a day of worship on one day over another. And don't forget the context of Romans. Paul is addressing both Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians in Rome. Some of the Jewish Christians were still reverting to their Hebrew heritage and observing Sabbath on the seventh day or Saturday, 
where most of the Gentile Christians were probably observing their day of rest and their day of worship on the first day of the week, on Sunday. And we can easily see both sides of the argument. God established the Sabbath for the Jews through the Mosaic Law. And when Christ rose from the dead on the first day of the week, the early Christians established Sunday as their day of rest and worship and body assembly. So which one is right? Or does it not matter? Well, in some ways it matters. And in other ways, it's not supposed to matter. Here's how it matters. It matters for the person who holds the conviction. Look back at Romans 14 and verse 5 where Paul says, Each individual should be fully convinced in his own mind. That's where it matters. That you are fully convinced that where you stand on a grayish area is right for you before God. Where it should not matter is in your perception of where someone else is convinced of what is right. That's not your business. That's not your concern. Your business is, number one, that you do not judge, and number two, that your actions do not cause another to stumble against their own conscience. That is where they are fully convinced in their own mind they should stand on a topic. And let me make one thing very clear here. There are some very black and white issues that will never be gray areas. We call them sin. These are not up for debate. For instance, I cannot justify an extramarital affair. That will always be sin because God says so. I can never justify the use of pornography, even if my wife is annoying the fire out of me or is herself being unfaithful to me. God calls it sin, and therefore I cannot be fully convinced in my heart and mind of anything contrary to God's moral law. Now, Paul is addressing days of rest and church assembly in this chapter. He is also addressing clean and unclean foods, things that we just don't argue over much anymore. So let me try to give you an example of what might be a grayish area today. Let's take monetary giving, tithes and offerings. And over the past two years, I've had several conversations about this topic with people in the church. And so I know without a doubt that there are families on both sides of this topic. So I have on good grounds that many families in the church tithe. They take the Old Testament principle of a 10% tithe, and that is their baseline for giving. Others in the church have taken the principle from 1 Corinthians 16 and give out of their abundance as God has prospered them. We might call that free will giving or free will offering. Uh, it might land around 10% of income, like a tithe would. It might be a little less. It might be way more. But let's apply some principles from this passage. Number one, no judging allowed. Ernie, who is a free will giver, cannot judge Bert for tithing, nor will Bert call Ernie a pompous overachiever for giving freely out of his abundance, of which God has blessed him. All right, no judging allowed. Number two, if you know that an issue is a gray area among other believers in the church, your actions must not be a cause for stumbling for them or an area that could convince them or cause them to offend against what they are already convinced is right. Now to illustrate this, I've chosen an issue that I don't think is divisive. Now, every year my family and I celebrate National Bacon Day. And I'm pretty sure we've even posted pictures on Facebook chronicling our proud heritage of bacon consumption. Now if I were to find out that Weston has a strong moral issue with eating bacon, and he derives that conviction from Leviticus, what is my responsibility to Weston? Well, I need to take whatever measures possible to ensure that our celebration of bacon does not cause Weston to stumble against what he believes is right in any way. That might mean not posting any more pictures of our celebrations on Facebook. Uh, we definitely can't serve bacon when Weston is over for dinner. Uh, it may even mean that we abstain from all pork products while we are members of this church. But under no circumstances can we be a stumbling block to Weston as it relates to bacon. And that brings us to the third principle. Everyone must be fully convinced in his own mind of right and wrong in these gray areas. Fully convinced. Now, these are pretty non-confrontational examples that I brought up, so hopefully we all get the point. Others are a lot more overt and tend to be a lot more divisive. 
but the principles for handling them are the same. And I'm almost out of time, so let me read a couple more verses that really emphasize the importance of this. Start with verse 15. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. That is pretty strong. Uh, going on, by what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. That as well is pretty strong. Look at verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is not material. It's not about what you eat or what you drink. It's about the spiritual matters. What is righteous, what is peaceful, what is joyful in the Holy Spirit. And here, Paul is really getting after our priorities, our perspectives, uh, our faithfulness to God. Life is not about us. Our Christian lives are about Christ. Colossians 1, 15 through 23 is another passage integral to our understanding. It helps us with a Christ-centered perspective that allows us to align our priorities in faithful living to God. I'll leave you with one more verse, and then I need to end. Verse 20, now this is another sharp command. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Probably the greatest superpower that all of us possess is the ability to destroy the work of God. And Paul says that we can easily accomplish that destruction of God's good work um, and what God is doing in someone else's life by keeping our focus on the petty shenanigans that do not matter. If we all submit our priorities to God's, we will grow as a church in love and in righteousness and in peace and in joy. And of utmost importance, we will grow more and more into the likeness of Christ our Savior.